Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring town, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for this is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. There's a lot of stuff going on in our scripture lessons today. There's a lot of stuff that might draw our attentions, make us notice or wonder about. The Isaiah text oh, has some of those phrases that just cause our souls to be buoyant, to, to lift up, that we shall not grow faint. Those who wait on the Lord shall be lifted up. And we go, oh yeah. So there are things in the texts that draw us, that make us wonder, that make us scratch our heads. The second lesson, 1 Corinthians. We've been in the second lesson for a couple of weeks now, and there are those times we read 1 Corinthians and we go, what? And we scratch our heads. Things that we might wonder, we might Notice the psalm. I love the fact that the psalm starts off with hallelujah, a way of saying praise the Lord, and ends with hallelujah. Praise the Lord, capturing. Things that we we read that draw our attention in, that make us wonder and pay attention. Now there are those of us in our congregation that I call note takers. Laura Lee is one of them. I love it. The fact that you have, have the text there and, and you see it and you highlight something and you cause, you, you take a question mark next to it, which uh, is wonderful. And, and I would highlight or I would suggest, because there are times that we'll read a text and we'll go, I have no clue what this means. I wonder about this or I notice. And you might highlight it so that later in the week you might spend time going back and going, What does the text say around it? What's this all about? Because there are those things that draw our attention. The gospel lesson is no different. The gospel has Jesus on the move. Mark, the gospel of Mark, Jesus is always, he's going from one place to another. Immediately, immediately, immediately. And there might be things that that cause our attention to be drawn where we focus on a particular passage or, or with the fact that in this gospel lesson has Jesus telling the demons, don't tell anybody about me because they knew who he was. And we might go, what's that all about? That can be an entire Bible study by itself. But I'm drawn I'm drawn to one particular passage, one particular verse in this gospel lesson. And it is, in the morning while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. While it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he 
he prayed. I'm drawn to it. I'm drawn to it because here we, we see Jesus and we've got all kinds of things happening around him where he, he shows up and he casts out this demon and then next he's going to go places and he's doing healings and all kinds of things are happening around him. But here, in the middle of the text, while it was still very dark, he gets up and he goes out to a deserted place and he now we in this geographical location know what it's like to live in a place that gets dark. My parents love to visit. They're going to be coming uh, just out after Valentine's Day, the 15th of February. Just so for those of you who know them, they'll show up and worship with us. And they love visiting. But my dad says that he could not possibly live here because he does not like the cloud cover. And we get a little bit of that around here. So there are those of us that need to put out the sad lights, the seasonal affective disorder lights, where, where it shines upon us because there are those who are affected by that dark. When I was in Juneau, January 21st was a holiday of holidays because that marked when the days started to get longer. And we would go, oh, the sun is returning. Now, Juno didn't get completely dark, but it spent enough time in the dusk that you really noticed. So we knew what it felt like when it was still very dark. But we also know that there can be another meaning to that phrase. While it was still very dark. The dark doesn't have to necessarily mean the sun or the light, but while it was still very dark, can be something that speaks much deeper. When the world presses in around us, when things are going in our heart, we're going on around in our lives. We know what it's like when it feels dark. We know when we have struggles with our neighbors, when we have fights among ourselves, when we're trying to make ends meet, when two dimes are having a hard time rubbing together. We know what it's like to be in moments of very dark. So here, when Jesus gets up while it was still very dark. Now, sometimes the mind and the brain and the heart, they, they're not very helpful because we, we, we fall into that trap that we go, oh, you know what? Yes, it's very dark, but if I just try to work harder, if I just try to press on, if I just get all of my ducks in the row, then everything will be all right. I can, I can cast away this darkness and I will be okay. We, we have friends or neighbors that, that remind us, they say, well, as it says in Scripture, God helps those who help themselves. Well, guess what? That isn't in Scripture. Nowhere is that in Scripture. I remember when a friend of mine first found out that that wasn't in Scripture and went, What? My mother always told me that that was in the Bible. No, it's not. But we can fall into that trap that as long as I can do this, as long as I can give give, give, as long as I can pour from my cup, then things will be okay. But we know, we know from experience, and we know from looking at an example of Jesus, that that's not the way it should be or it needs to be. 
when we look at Scripture, we get actually the opposite. We get stories of Job lamenting against God. We get Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane that says, Take this cup from me. And then we get Jesus while it was still very dark. He withdraws to a quiet place and prays. We might find ourselves wondering, how how can Jesus do this? How can Jesus withdraw when everybody is needing him, when everyone is... How can he do this? Because we might feel that in our own hearts. Well, how can I take time for myself? How can I do this? Because they need me. You might have heard that, you might have heard this phrase, which I think is a phrase that many of us need to put on our refrigerators or on our bathroom mirrors that says, you can't pour from an empty cup. Not only is it important, but it is necessary for us to find times to recharge, to find times for prayer, to find times where we say, I need to take that moment. But we, we struggle with that. We, we know that in the midst of confusion, we know that we are so human that we, we fight that, that battle between the fight or the flight. That there's got to be the two, two extremes. Yet we realize that we are given another way. That in the midst of darkness and wonder and in the midst of confusion. We have a God that draws near to us and we have a God that draws us near to God. That as we come and we receive bread and wine, as we receive the grace of God, we have a God that beckons us to spend time, to be in the presence of the Creator. It is so easy for us to forget. It is so easy for me to to think, If I need to get it all right, I I need to have everything okay. If if I if I don't have everything all right, then I'm in trouble. Or maybe the fact is is that I am, and yet I forget that God draws near to me. That I can stop scrambling. That I can stop trying to make all of the puzzle pieces fit. And I can just lay them at the feet of Jesus. And say, okay. uh, I've had enough. And Jesus says, all right, it's taking you a while, but good. Come. Come and rest a while. Come and be with me. Well, there's that poem. Many of you have seen it. The, the poem that says, it's the footprint poem. 
where there's the footprints and they're walking along and there's the footprints to say and, and the person's talking to Jesus and there's the footprints and, and then there's only a, a single set of footprints and the guy's, guy or gal is talking to Jesus and says, I, I noticed that, that there's two sets of footprints but then in the hardest parts of my life there's one set of footprints. Why is that? And, and it's great. I love the poem because it says in there, it says, oh, because in those times, those were the times that I was carrying you. Which I go, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. And I go, ah, oh, that's neat. But, and not, not but, because that's, that's great. However, I also notice that that's not always my experience. My experience is that I, I, I have that poem, and then, then I look over there and I say, but Jesus... What, what are those two grooves that, that are in the sand? And Jesus goes, oh, that's where I had to drag you. <laughs> because I'm not a quick learner. I am not a quick learner. So there are time and time again where I forget that I need to take time, where I need to rest with Jesus, and I forget and I try to do it myself, and I stumble, and I struggle. And Jesus says, spend time with me. So today, when you come and you receive bread and wine, when you receive the grace of our God, receive that invitation to spend time with Jesus. Maybe this week, carve out an extra five minutes. And now, for some who have long devotion and, and active prayer lives, they might say, five minutes. But if you're like me, who pays attention to every squirrel that comes into your life, you know, squirrel! Five minutes can seem like an eternity. Take that five minutes to rest, to spend time to fill your own cup or let God fill your own cup so that when you go into your lives, when you are sent out into the world, you have that much more to give as you come into life that God is calling you to. And as you spend that five minutes, ten minutes, two minutes, one minute, be gentle on yourselves. Be gentle on yourselves. Don't use that five minutes as a time to beat yourself up. But just to sit and say, God, take this from me. Amen.